All right, we're going to finish the notes today, and then if we finish early, um, then I guess it's family feud time. Or we'll start the next section, right? Yeah. The next section is uh, parametrics. So if we started parametrics today, like at the last five minutes of class, I'm sure you all remember it nine days from now. All right. Dang, where's my stylus? Don't you hate it when you leave the house and you forget your finger? At least you always have your stylus. I got that backwards. Okay. Uh, find the area bounded by the graph of 1 over x and the x-axis over the interval from negative 2 to 2. So it says, again, symmetry can be your friend unless you uh, are not looking for friends and just turn it away. Forget you, symmetry. All right, so 1 over x, we know a lot about 1 over x, or we've come to learn a lot about 1 over x in this section, right? Not to make a judgment call, but it is what it is. It's very lazy, right? Very lazy. Vertical asymptote, horizontal asymptote. The area bounded by the graph of 1 over x. Okay, so from negative 2 to 2. Yep. So, um, is there a way to answer this question without lifting a finger of calculus? Same thing. What does that mean? You said infinity. I heard you say same thing. Did you say infinity? It's that what's it? What's your pro antecedent? The graph of 1 over x as what? We approach what? Oh, great, 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 good. So we already know from experience that this area here from 0 to 2 uh, diverges because 1 over x does not approach the axis fast enough. So it would diverge to positive infinity. Yes, yes? And then what would happen from uh, negative 2 to 0? Right. It's it's going to be a negative value because it's below. And um, the question is, are those the same type of infinity? Because negative infinity plus infinity or infinity minus infinity is indeterminate form. But in this case, good morning. Thank you. Colin, you have permission to check out. Sweet. Um, yes, yeah, very good. This is the same graph. It has origin symmetry. So uh, in general, infinity minus infinity is not zero. But in this case, because it is formed by the exact same curve in a different location, this is zero. So you could answer the question um, without actually doing any calculus, right? So an origin function on a symmetrical interval, when you integrate it, even if there's a vertical asymptote now in the way, is zero. Right is zero, and uh, I'm going to leave that as a proof to you. If you want to do it over spring break, uh, you'd have to split it up, right? You'd have to go from negative two to zero of one over x dx plus zero to two one over x dx, and then of course because it's improper, uh, you would have to say the limit as b approaches zero from the left from negative two to b of one over x dx. And uh, was it one of y'all yesterday that says, why can't we just reuse B? No? Okay. Well, yeah, why can't we? Well, we actually can because it's really the same B value and it's two separate expressions, so there's not going to be any confusion. But you know what? Sometimes it's just a good excuse to use another letter of the alphabet. And then, of course, uh, if you evaluated it, that would be the natural log of the absolute value of X from negative 2 to B plus the natural log of the absolute value of x from b to 2. And oops, I missed the limit, but thank goodness for notability. You can just scooch it over. That's a great word. Scooch? Is that one of the 180 words that Merriam-Webster added recently? Scooch? I don't think so. We talked about some of the words, right? No, did we not? Was that not this class? Dumpster fire, they added the compound word, right? What's a dumpster fire? A fire and dumpster, but now it's become synonymous with officially in Merriam-Webster, right? A disaster, right? A dumpster fire is a disaster, right? Like I took the take-home test light last night and pff, dumpster fire, right? What's that? D-U-M-P-S-T-E-R-F-I-R-E, dumpster fire. 
Oh, Scooch. Uh, um, I guess it'd be uh, S C O O T C H, right? Scooch. Scooch it over. Um, what was another word? Um, yeah, believe it or not, case sensitive. The compound word is now officially in the dictionary. Previously, it's just been two words, case and sensitive, put together. Is it? What does it mean? To scooch? So it doesn't involve movement? It's like stationary to crouch. Mm. Okay. I don't really care for Merriam-Webster. Um, all right. So anyway, they added, they added a bunch of new words. You can Google it and find out. But scooch is a stationary thing. He was scooching behind the bush. He was crouching, right? Okay. I have always used scooch to to be movement, so my bad. I apologize. That's why that's why everyone has been confused. All right. So uh, anyway, I said y'all could do this over spring break. I've kind of gone pretty far, but I think I'll stop right there. Now that I'm so embarrassed with uh, my misuse of scooch. Okay. I guess I'm getting scooch kind of confused with scoot. Scoot? Does scoot mean to stand tall? I hope not. If scooch is the yeah no scoot like boot scoot and boogie it's not boot scooch and boogie that would not be a line dance that'd be like a stationary um, scoot means to move while seated so like you're scooching and moving at the same time golly southern. You scoot on out of here. Did you say scooch on out of here? Because that's really hard to do. <laughs> out of here is over there, and I'm scooching right here. Letter 17. He's still calling numbers letters. All right. Find the length of the curve. Length of the curve. Ooh, I think that was on the take-home test. Curve length. It was? Perimeter. What's that? We're not allowed to talk about the test, not for at least two days, okay? If you do that, I will have to destroy your test. God, that, I could do it. I could do that. It was always funny when I, I had to, like, administer, like, standardized tests, like the tax, the TOS, or whatever you all take now, the ESC, because uh, we have to read the star. We have to read the words there that are it's written there. It's a script. And, and one of the things that says if, if, you know, I don't know what it says before, but if you were caught cheating, during the test, or if your cell phone goes off, I will have to collect your test. And then it says, I will have to collect your test and destroy your test. And that's what it says. Like, I will have to destroy your test. And I was just so nervous, like, gosh dang it, I hope no one cheats or the cell phone goes off because I will physically have to destroy their test. And and I can I could do like Kilford. I can get my adrenaline going. I can get really mad really fast. And I can pick your test up, and I can destroy the heck out of it. And I just, I don't want to go there. Um, you know, what would it involve? How would I destroy it? I mean, it's not like just I'm going to toss it in the trash can. I'm not going to put it in the paper. I'm going to literally destroy it. I'm going to obliterate your test. It's going to be vaporized. You're not going to recognize it, right? Um, incinerated, I don't know. We're going to change the physical and the chemical composition of your test. And I'm going to do it in a very violent and angry manner. I will destroy your test. <laughs> I just thought maybe there could have been a less, you know, violent word. I will, I will have to confiscate your test, right, and turn it over to the authorities, right? I will have to carefully retrieve your test and gently give it to the, the, the proper people. Um, but, no, I, I had to destroy it. And it didn't say that, I, you know, that I could do it out in the hall. It kind of implied that I would have to do it right there in front of the other students, right? Luckily, I never had to, to do that. All right. Find the length of the curve defined by that on the interval from 0 to 2. Use your result to find the circumference of the circle. What? Okay. All right, so what does the graph of y equals 4 minus x squared look like? This is kind of a parent function, but not really. You should know what this looks like. If you, what? If you square both sides, you get y squared equals 4 minus x squared. If you then add x squared to both sides, you get x squared plus y squared equals 4, and that is the equation of a cycle. So when you solve it for y and you get the positive root, that is the top half of the cycle, whose radius is what? 2. Yeah, this is r squared. So uh, you would come up 2 here, 
a 2 there, 2 there to negative 2, and you would draw it. Okay, and so what we're going to do now, since it's a curve, is we're going to find the arc length which is going to end up being the semi-perimeter, right? Wink, wink. We don't know that yet. We're just like walking up, hey, curve, what's happening? So, uh, of course, what are we going to need uh, in the equation of the arc length? The derivative. Yeah, so let's go ahead and do that. So we could do that now without having to rewrite it because we're that good. It's really blob to the one-half, so it would be one-half blob to the negative one-half, and that's 4 minus x squared times the chain rule which, remember, is different from the Shane rule. The Shane rule is come back. Negative 2x. We've gone over that. I know we have, right? Okay. Um, all right, so now if we clean that up, because we're going to have to use it, the 1 half and the 2 divide out, and I'm left with the negative x over the square root of 4 minus x squared. All right, so there is the derivative, and now we're ready to set up the arc length formula. So the arc length, L, is the sum of the infinitely small line segments, right, from left to right, negative 2 to 2, of the square root, which acts as a grouping symbol for the terms under the radical, 1 plus that derivative squared dx. And you want to make sure that the squared is under the radical and the dx is outside of it. So uh, be careful. I'll be looking for that on your take-home test. Crap. All right. There we go. Uh, there's the setup. Now, some of those on there said, right, set up but do not evaluate, uh, which is nice. You would be done, essentially, at this point. Um, but we want to actually evaluate it. So let's go ahead and proceed. Now, someone asked this morning, when do we have to put equal sign? That's a great question. If we have an equation to start with, like I, I tell you to kind of name your variables, so length equals the integral, then when we work straight down, we just keep the equal sign going, and then it's kind of keeping it equal to length the whole time. But in the absence of calling that L, if I just set up an integral expression, now when I work straight down, I don't need equal signs. Okay, so if you have an expression, uh, just, just work straight down. All right, but I called it L, so I'm going to keep it equal to Can't write with an eraser. All right, there you go. I guess technically you can in some cases, but we won't go there. All right. Um, what was that? You went there? What did you say? You went there, yeah, okay. X squared over 4 minus X squared. Uh, dx. All right. Now we're going to have to be able to integrate that uh, puppy. So, any ideas what to do, what to do? How about under the radical? We have two terms. You want to get a common denominator so we can get a single term? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Because I do not recognize the square root of all that as a recognizable antiderivative even using the uh, techniques that we have. So uh, we can call 1 4 minus x squared over 4 minus x squared. Now, if I did that, I would have 4 minus x squared plus x squared, right? The x squared would cancel, bless you. And so I'd be left with 4 over 4 minus x squared. So I, I skipped a couple of steps there, but you all are BC, so you all can follow it, right? Okay. If you need to show more steps that you don't mess up, by all means do so. Okay, so now, okay, so now that we have a single fraction, it's really two factors, we can take the square root of the top and bottom independently. So new column. So when you're working, you don't need to draw an arrow like this up to the next column. That's kind of like little school stuff. Um, I usually draw a vertical line. Sometimes I get kind of excited and I wiggle a little bit on the way down. But it doesn't matter. You really don't even need that. If you just go to the next column, it's understood you're continuing the work. So that'll be the integral from negative 2 to 2 of 2 over the square root of 4 minus x squared, dx. And now if you want to rewrite it, you can bring the 2 out front, negative 2 to 2 of 1 over the square root of 4 minus x squared. And now it should be in recognizable integration form. If there were an x in the top, it would be pattern recognition, bring it to the top, power rule it. But there is no x on the top. So the derivative of 4 minus x squared, negative 2x, it's not up there. But it does look a lot like a what? An arc sine. Yeah, yeah. An arc sine. Yeah, very good. So uh, let's go ahead and write our little information right below there. Uh, arc sine is number minus function, so 4 is a squared, so a would be its square root. u squared is x squared, so u is x. And remember, we check one thing for arc sine. The thing we're calling u, in this case x, its derivative 
Better be the other factor in the in the integrand or only off by a constant. Our derivative is one. We're not off by anything. So the two goes along for the ride. Uh, and by the way, I could have used symmetry here, by the way, right? Just FYI, kind of in retrospect. I could have gone from zero to two and doubled it, but whatever. And it's still not too late to do that if we want. So the two goes along for the ride. And um, there is no correction to make since our derivative was spot on. So now, gosh, I have to remember, the arc sine rule, does it have a 1 over A or does it not have a 1 over A? It does not have a 1 over A. So I just go straight to arc sine of U over A, which is X over 2 from negative 2 to 2. Okay, so do you like plugging in negative 2? Do you like evaluating arc sine of negative 1? Ooh, do you remember the principal value range of arc sine? Heck no. If you have a negative ratio, it's going to be either in quadrant 3 or 4, but remember, we don't go all the way around to do it. We go straight down, so it'll be a negative acute angle. So that's why using symmetry could be nice. Let's go ahead and use symmetry at this point. The 2 is there already, but now I'm going to introduce another 2, and I'm going to integrate arc sine of x halves. Oops. Arc sine of x halves from 0 to 2. And now when I plug in a 0, arc sine of 0 is going to be a little bit easier. So you can still use symmetry at the end there. All right, so now i got 4 beefy bracket. Arc sine of 2 halves, which is 1, minus arc sine of 0 halves. F of 0 is what? 0. 0, yeah. Um, so if it were a free response, then there wouldn't really be any need to put symmetry there. You could just have arc sine of the quantity negative 2. But we want to evaluate this. So... What is arc sine of 1? Sine of what positive first quadrant angle gives you 1? Or it could be up all the way to, well, that would be square root of 2 halves. The PVR for arc sine, for what it's worth, was here to here. So from negative pi halves inclusive to pi halves inclusive. Yeah. And our tangent was the same, except we couldn't have the pi halves. There were parentheses. So if you ever take the arc sine of a positive ratio, it's going to be a positive acute angle. And if you ever take the arc sine of a negative uh, number ratio, it's going to be a negative acute angle. Same thing with arc tangent. Our cosine was the one that was the sun on the horizon. That one's going to be quadrants one and two. So you can get an obtuse angle. All right. So anyway, this was pi halves. And then arc sine of zero is zero. Cos sine of zero is zero. And then four pi halves is also known as two pi. Wow. Okay, great. So, now that we know that the length of this curve, which looks very semicircular-ish, uh, is 2 pi, it now says to use your result to find the circumference of the circle x squared plus y squared plus 4. Well, the only difference then is the, the full circle is going to have a symmetrical bottom part, right? And so, it turns out then that the circumference of the circle is going to be two of those dudes, right? which is 4 pi. four pi. Yeah. Now let's verify that by using the formula that Archimedes gave us. Circumference is 2 pi r. Pi d, okay, pi d. Pi d, that's fine. Pi, 2 pi r. Um, so what's our radius? 2. So when we plug it in, 2 pi times 2 is 4 pi. So we do get the same answer. In fact, just like we derived the formula for the volume of a sphere using calculus, could you derive the formula for the circle of a the formula for a circle of a perimeter of a circumference? Could you derive the formula? Let me try it again. Could you derive the formula of the circumference of a circle using an arc length formula? Yeah, you can. We essentially did with numbers. All you had to do was replace a two with an r and uh, double it at the end, and you can you could derive the circumference formula. So that's not quite how Archimedes derived it, but doesn't matter how you arrive at a result. Mathematics uh, is cool that way. They all kind of confirm the same thing. There are lots of different proofs of the Pythagorean theorem. Lots and lots and lots and lots. Do you know the only president to have an original verified proof of the Pythagorean theorem? No. 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 No, not Hoover. 
No, he was actually one of our smartest presidents. He was ambidextrous, and he <laughs> he could he could not only work with both hands independently, but he could work with them at the same time. Teddy Roosevelt was certainly one of our best or, 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 or most talented presidents. He was a published author uh, as a teenager, yeah, and one of my favorites. But no, 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 not, not Roosevelt. Abe Lincoln is my favorite president, and, and yeah, um, certainly a saint in my book. But uh, Abe Lincoln, by the way, since you brought it up, he is the only U.S. president with a, with a patent. Abraham Lincoln is the only U.S. president with a U.S. patent. He used to work on, on the Mississippi River uh, with river boats, and they used to have these uh, sandbars in the middle that were hard for boats to get over. So he invented and patented a, an inflatable thing. Scribner, you're not going to be in class today. Okay, awesome. Well, not awesome that you're not going to be here. But Scribner's not going to be here today. Awesome. All right. But thank you for turning it in early. That's awesome. So he invented, he inflated these inflatable things that would raise the boat up. They would drop into the water, and they would inflate. And go under it, and they would lift it up out of the water and be able to go over the sandbar. Yeah, so he patented it. So Abraham Lincoln. But no, the, the, uh, he was one of – Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, right? Yeah, yeah. And there were how many others that were assassinated? There were three others, so four total. So the guy with the original Pythagorean theorem proof was one of the other assassinated ones. No, not JFK. JFK was the only one to win a Pulitzer, I believe. Garfield, and I heard Garfield earlier. Yeah, Garfield. The president, not the cat, right? Yeah, Garfield, um, Garfield's assassination was probably one of the most painful ones because he didn't die right away. He died weeks later, and he actually died because um, of the infection. All these doctors came, and they were, like, probing him, trying to find and get out the bullet. Even Alexander Graham Bell, the phone guy, hello, he came and tried to find it. So, they were probing around, sticking him, trying to find the bullet and get the bullet, and he got massive infection, and that's how he died. Um, but anyway, Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert, by the way, was present at the assassination of Garfield, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, Garfield, James Garfield. Yeah, or Jimmy, as they like to call him. Determine if the following integral is convergent. You learn some trivia now, right? Determine if the following integral is convergent or divergent. If it's convergent, find its value. Oh, whoa, what does it say here? Sometimes an integral can be dastardly double, doubly improper. I wonder what that means. All right, so we have the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 over x squared. This doesn't look dastardly at all. What's happening? Yeah, well, first of all, we know it's improper immediately because we're going to infinity. We're approaching the horizontal asymptote. If we look at the domain, right, we're used to looking for rattlesnakes under rocks now. We know that x cannot equal 0, and uh, there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 0, and pff, that's an interval of integration. Now, intuition goes a long way in these types of problems, as we've seen. So let's think about what the graph of 1 over x squared looks like. It's the graph of 1 over x, but it's squared. Huh? So all the y values are positive, and it's a little steeper. So I, I used to call this the volcano graph, right? and then skews down, All right? Um, it's a volcano graph. So what's going to happen from zero to infinity? What's going to happen as we go to infinity? Converge or diverge for one over x squared? Converge, right? Bless you. As we go to the right towards infinity, it should converge. Yes, yes. But as we approach um, um, the vertical asymptote at zero, what's going to happen there? It should diverge. Who wins the party with the divergence plus convergence? What? No, 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 no. This one is not that one. Because this one is essentially infinite plus finite, right? So infinity plus uh, a finite number is still infinity. So it will converge going out to the right, but because it diverges going up to infinity, um, it's an infinite unbounded region that is also truly infinite. All right, so let's, let's verify that. Whew. Now, if we're going to use the right notation, and we might as well, okay, um, that's going to not be fun. Um, we're going to have whew, the limit as ugh, mm, uh, yeah, yeah. b goes to zero from the right, 
of the integral from B to A? Mm -hmm. What do we do? One? Yeah, let's pick a number. I like that. Let's pick a number. Yeah, because if I go from B to C, I'm going to have a limit of a limit, and it's going to be like, what? What's the order? So let's just pick one. I like that. Can't pick zero. Can't pick zero because I'm starting at zero. So let's pick one. It's a nice and easy number of x to the negative tooth power dx plus now the limit as uh, c goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to c. Yeah, I like that. Good idea, Clancy. There we go. So another one where we have to kind of split it up. All right, so now if we evaluate it, we've got the limit as b goes to 0 from the right. Uh, that's going to be x to the negative first times negative 1 from b to 1, plus the limit as c goes to infinity of the same thing, negative 1 x to the negative first from 1 to c. Plug it in, plug it in, plug it in, plug it in. Negative beefy bracket. 1 to the negative first is 1. B to the negative first, I'm going to write it as 1 over b. This makes it easier to evaluate. Plus, uh, the limit of c goes to infinity. We get negative beefy bracket. c to the negative first, again, I'm going to write that as 1 over c, easier to evaluate. And then minus 1 to the negative first is 1. All right, now it's time to evaluate the limits. So in the first one, what happens to 1 over b is b goes to 0 from the right-hand side. So 1 over 0, of course, is some type of infinity. Because we're approaching from the positive side, we're going to have 1 over a positive, which should be positive infinity, right? So that's negative 1 plus infinity. So I'll go ahead and just dare to write it there. Um, and then evaluating the next one. What happens to 1 over c is c goes to infinity. That one goes to 0, right? So I'm left with minus a negative 1, which is plus 1. And so if I distribute, look what actually happens. I get a negative 1 plus 1. That actually cancels, and I'm just left with infinity. So, yeah, as we suspected, from understanding what's going on, it diverges. It diverges. Now, notice if we were just to evaluate the second part from 1 to infinity, we'd have negative negative 1, which is positive 1. That would be our convergent p-series, right? From 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared, it would be 1 over p minus 1. 1 over 2 minus 1 is 1 over 1, which is 1. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sweet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 0 to infinity. I put positive infinity because of our graph. Why would it be negative infinity? Did I miss the sign somewhere? If you look at our picture here, since it's 1 over x squared, and we're going from left to right, it should be positive infinity. Ah, <laughs> thank you, thank you. It was right here, right here. Yeah, I, pull, I kept my negative 1 out, and then I plugged in the top, and plus plugged in the bottom. That was bad. Good catch, good eye. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, if, if you know what an answer is supposed to be, I knew it was supposed to be positive infinity, and you don't fix it all the way through, that would have been like a double penalty. I would have had the wrong answer from my calculation. Um, well, that would have only been one penalty. Um, no, it would have been two. It would have been two. It would have been two. Right, right. It would have been two penalties. Um, so if you know what the answer is supposed to be and you're not getting that, then you need to go back up in the mechanics somewhere and fix it, okay, so that it, that it does actually work. So good eye, good catch, positive infinity, teamwork, teamwork. What's going to work? Calculus Yeah, okay. <laughs> Calculus will work. Okay, so here it is. We're finishing with example 19. Um, we have Evangeliste Torricelli. He was um, German. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, Evangeliste Torricelli. It sounds very what to me? It sounds like a dish you'd order with meatballs, right? Yeah, yeah, Italian, Italian mathematician. Um, he actually dabbled. He dabbled in barometric pressure. He, uh, Pascal, this guy here, Blaise Pascal, who built the first mechanical computing device, by the way. So really, kind of the father of mechanical computers. Um, he also made the first barometric uh, bar was it barometer. There you go. Mercury. He made the first mercury thermometer. Because before they were using mercury, they were just using, like, water, you know? 
And that's, um, that's what Torricelli was doing. Torricelli kind of pioneered the work in the barometric or the barometer. Uh, Pascal kind of perfected it. So there is a unit of barometric pressure, you know, milligrams of mercury called the Pascal. But there's also a unit called the Tor. Have you heard of the unit called the Tor? Guess who it's named after? Torricelli. Okay. So you probably didn't know that because he, he didn't really like to toot his own horn. Um, so sometimes this problem is actually called Gabriel's horn because Torricelli was like, no, no, really, really, don't name it after me. And I don't know if that's an Italian accent or not. Okay, so here's why this one is going to like whoosh, blow the meatballs out of your brain. F of X is 1 over X. Got it. Okay, from 1 to infinity. Okay, super duper. Let R be the unbounded region in the first quadrant below the graph of F. Okay, great. So here we go. Do, 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 do. 1 over X. That's all I need. We're going from 1 to infinity. So this is not new to us. We've seen this before. It's that unbounded region. Now, we know that the area does what? Diverges or converges? Yeah, the area diverges. Okay, but what are we doing with it? We're taking it for a spin around the x-axis. Yeah. All right? So when I take it for a spin around the x-axis, I'm going to slice this thing horizontally. You can slice it however you want to. So f of x is 1 over x. A vertical slice, a horizontal axis. That's perpendicular. Our area is flush up against the axis. So here we go. By the, I'll go ahead and write it. You don't have to do this. Perpendicular. V for volume or VOL for volume. What goes in front for the disc or washer? Pi times the sum of the infinitely thin slices from uh, 1 to infinity of R squared of H, which is dx. So again, this is your radius. You only have one radius. So from the axis to the curve, anywhere is the radius. Okay? So there's only one radius, and it's top minus bottom, so it's 1 over x minus 0. So there's the setup, right? Kyler, are you already, you're already, you're already at the conclusion here? Hang on, let's catch up. Um, so that's 1 over infinity. 1 over x minus 0, 1 over x. 1 over x squared is 1 over x squared. 1 squared over x squared. Okay, now. We can evaluate this without actually having to find the antiderivative. Yes, yes? Because this is a convergent P series. We're going from some positive value to infinity. It's 1 over x squared. P is equal to 2. 2 is greater than 1. But because we're starting at 1, we know the sum of that is what? 1 over P minus 1, right? If you start at 1 and it's a convergent P series, then the sum or the area is 1 over p minus 1. And p is what? 2, right? So that ends up being 2 minus 1 is 1. 1 over 1 is 1. We get pi. And that would be cubic units. Okay, pi cubic units. So here's the thing. If you rotate that thing around, and we've seen a problem like this before, you get an infinitely long trombone bell, or if you turn it vertically, you get a bottomless funnel, right? Now, here's the thing. We have a finite volume, right? So that was exactly what we saw last time. You turn the funnel vertically, and even though it goes down forever and ever and ever and ever, and it's bottomless, we're saying you could go buy paint that is pi cubic units, and you could pour it into that bottomless funnel, and it would perfectly fill up to the top, which is bizarre in itself, right? It is bizarre in itself that a bottomless funnel can have a finite volume. That's crazy. But here's the crazier part. The area diverges, right? There is a surface area formula, and it's not a BC topic, but it's, a, it's kind of like finding the area in two dimensions. If you found the, the surface area of this, right? And you can find the surface area of the funnel on the outside or on the inside because it's infinitely thin. It turns out that not only the area, the two-dimensional uh, thing diverges, but the surface area, the surface area is also divergent, which means it's infinite, okay? So why is that irreconcilable? Let's think about finding the surface area on the inside of the funnel, on the inside of the funnel. What we're saying then is you can fill the bottomless funnel up to the tippy-top brim with pi cubic units of paint, but that paint that is contained by the funnel is not enough paint to coat the inside of the funnel that's containing it. 
That's the surface area, right? Think about that for a second, okay? You've got a funnel. It's a rigid container. It's bottomless. It is filled up to the brim with pi cubic units, even though it's bottomless. Boom. But now the paint that's on the inside of the funnel, contained by the funnel, is not enough paint to coat the inside of the funnel because it has an infinite surface area. You're like, no, no, what's the punchline, man? Okay. Torricelli, Torricelli lost a lot of sleep over this. He discovered it, and he was like, that can't be. That can't be. Okay, and so he went to his friends and like, hey, can you check my work? And they're like, dude, thanks a lot. You just messed up my life. Okay, I'm never going to sleep again. This is irreconcilable. Okay, this is like a huge paradox. Because certainly if I fill my water bottle, there is enough water on the inside to coat the inside of the bottle, right? With plenty of water to boot. We're just talking about the water that's touching the edges. We got all the water in the middle. So we have plenty of enough water to coat the inside of my bottle, right? But not with the infinite funnel. You could fill it up to the top, and it's touching the side everywhere, right? Otherwise, it would spill out, right? So it's got to be touching the sides. Otherwise, it would spill out. But it's not. It's not touching the sides everywhere. Nor is there enough paint, even if you could pressurize it to squeeze it down into those tiny little pieces at the bottom, it's still not enough paint to coat the inside. Not going to happen. Sorry. Even though it's filled to the top. Hmm. Anyone have an answer to that? Anyone, can anyone reconcile that so that we can, uh, I don't know, Torricelli's ghost is like floating around right now saying, see, see I told you, I told you, it just, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Okay, let's go back to the uh, barometer, at least that makes sense, right? It doesn't make sense. It has an infinite surface area, but a finite volume. Right, if it doesn't bother you, you don't appreciate you don't appreciate the paradox. All right? So maybe that's good. Right? Ignorance is bliss. You'll sleep sound like a baby. I don't know what he's talking about. Right? Right? All right. So anyway, that's it. That's it. We're done. We're done with improper integrals. All right? Any questions other than Torricelli's trumpet or Gabriel's horn? Maybe they called it Gabriel's horn because Gabriel's like the archangel Gabriel out of the Bible. And the only way to explain that is like, God can do anything. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea, right? Any other questions? All right, we're done. We're in plenty of time to kind of anticipate taking the stand. So, George, Shelley, and it's true. You could Google it. There's entire sites devoted to this. 